Hello everyone. I am Wasim Akram. I welcome you all to this lecture titled Extreme Poverty. Is it a wicked problem? I'm a doctoral researcher at the university here. And before I go into the presentation, I would like to introduce me a little bit more because it has some relation with the lecture today. So my background is international relations. And uh, I have also a postgraduate diploma in international development studies from University of Oslo. And um, before enrolling in the PhD here, I have worked for around 12 years in the development sector in Bangladesh and worked for mostly the extreme poor people. And I have, um, that means I have really got the opportunity to work directly with them for them. And uh, I have got the opportunity to work for organizations like Oxfam, Action on Disability and Development, BRAC, Plan International, and before, just before the PhD, I was working for the European Commission for three and a half years, uh, and I was managing the portfolio of extreme poverty in Bangladesh. So with this background, um, let's start uh, the lecture today. In today's lecture, we'll first look at uh, some of the facts around extreme poverty in the world, and then we will uh, try to go to, to look at uh, one of the cases uh, from my PhD research. Just to let you know that I am doing my PhD on aging and extreme poverty in Bangladesh. So I am uh, trying to understand the lived experience of the older persons who are aging in extreme poverty conditions. So I will draw one case from there and we'll try to relate with how it relates with the overall um, dilemmas around public administration system and how poverty is really an issue of public administration as well. And I would uh, touch lightly on um, some of the issues in Bangladesh around public administration. And then we will try to understand poverty as a wicked problem and uh, then the dilemmas around it, what are the ways forward? And finally, we'll, we'll try to conclude uh, with some remarks. So in today's lecture, I have um, drawn mostly from these uh, sources. And if you are further interested to know more about a particular country and um, their exit poverty, you can watch uh, my video, uh, video lecture available in UR Play which is a very small video of 20 minutes or so. And then there is this paper on generational bargain transfer of disadvantages and extreme poverty from my PhD. And all, these two pieces will give you a sense of the complexity around extreme poverty that makes it uh, one of the wicked problems of our time. So traditionally, we understand extreme poverty uh, through the definition provided by the World Bank, which is around $1.9 per person per day for low and low income countries. And the threshold for lower middle income countries is $3.2. And for upper middle income countries, it's $5.5. And for high income countries like Sweden, the threshold is $21.7 per person per day. Now, the definition of extreme poverty doesn't really end here. It's even much more complex. In the rest of the discussion, we will definitely go back to this issue again and again to understand it better. And also I would like to keep you in mind that when we are saying about extreme poverty, we are saying about those people who are living below the threshold of, threshold of $1.9 a day for the lower uh, low income countries. So please bear this in mind. So we are not talking about uh, lower middle income, upper middle income, or high income countries like Sweden, although there is a threshold of extreme poverty there. Now, currently, there is around 736 million people who are living in extreme poverty, and they survive with less than $1.9 a day. And most of them are children, youth, or women. And half of them just live in five countries. And these countries are India, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh. Most of the extreme poor are concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa because around 40% of the people there live on less than $1.9 a day. 
And if we see the trends, extreme poverty rates nearly doubled in the Middle East and North Africa between 2015 and 18 uh, because of the crisis in Syria and Yemen. Around 70% uh, of the people who are um, older than 15 years and live in extreme poverty, they do not really have any schooling experience. And uh, we know that because of this COVID-19 from 2020 onwards, for the first time in the history, the number of uh, extreme poverty um, people is really increasing too much. And it is estimated that uh, around 88 to 150 million people would be pushed uh, towards extreme poverty in 2020, who would be the new uh, in this um, count. And this can also raise up to 150 million by 2021. In my research, what I have found that uh, extreme poor people are living even far below the threshold that we are uh, we have already mentioned. So most of my respond, uh, participants in the research, they're living even in the bottom uh, in the bottom line of this threshold. And I found that average monthly income of the household are uh, around 120 krona. So that means they're living around four krona a day, which is around less than 50 cents even a day. So you can imagine the, 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 the picture uh, and, and the living conditions uh, could be there. So here, here um, I would like to share with you some of the pictures that I have collected from my um, field, showing the living environment of the extreme poor older persons there, just to give an idea about the living uh, conditions. Now, I would like to uh, share with you one of the case studies here about a, a woman whom I met in Bangladesh when I was um, collecting my research data. And uh, we would like to um, even uh, reflect on this case later and le let's see how it relates with the public administration system and how extreme poverty is also uh, a failure of the system itself. So the woman, Shagorika, she is really a widow in her 70s. And I found her in one of the remotest uh, corner of Bangladesh, and she was living in an abandoned public building when I met her. She has two sons, but they really deserted her and migrated somewhere else. She had a home, but she lost it 10 years ago in repeated river erosion. And since then, she is living in the abandoned building. She worked sporadically as um, a household maid, but couldn't really continue long because people do, need, do not really want to hire older persons for household jobs. The building she lives now is not really at all suitable for human being to live. And I found her literally starving and survived only with puff rice for the last few days. And this puff rice she borrowed from a neighbor. She is not even sure whether she would be able to pay back. Occasionally, she goes for baking. And whenever she feels sick, she goes to the nearest uh, local pharmacy to request for medicine. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Although she was really eligible for old age allowance or widow allowance program of the, uh, of the country, but she had failed to get her enrolled in those programs. She believed that because no one has advocated for her and because she couldn't even pay bribe to the officials, she didn't receive it yet. At one point of the discussion, I asked her, what do you really need the most immediately? The answer I expected, maybe she would have said that I need food. But to my surprise, despite the visible symptoms of being malnourished, she said she needed a lamb, a kerosene lamb. Since the last 10 years living in the building, she couldn't light the room when it is dark because she couldn't afford to buy kerosene. At night, that this abundant building is shelter of cats, dogs, beasts, beasts, and other insects. And she is really very scared to live with them inside the building when it is dark. This case, I found it is really a kind of typical one representing those who are um, aging or getting old in extreme poverty condition, conditions or extreme marginalization and destitution. And uh, everyone in the community knows about Shagarika, but her situation didn't re really improve, rather it got worse and worse uh, every day. 
So with this short narrative about Shagorika, if we, if we really reflect back to the case, we will find that um, she is suffering from a number of uh, different kinds of poverty. First of all, she is suffering from poverty of relations. She has also income poverty. She has um, food poverty. She has energy poverty. She is also deprived of the basic rights and access and entitlements. So she has poverty of rights, uh, access and entitlements. And overall, as a human being, um, she has to live a kind of at least basic minimum decent life, so which she is deprived of. So maybe she is, she, we can say that she is also living uh, in poverty of dignity. Now, if we see there are, there are a range of institutions or uh, department or ministries were uh, engaged and that could have really uh, supported her in any phase of her life to, to get her situation better. But ultimately, what I have found from the case that uh, very few of them really even found her or, or played a role to change her uh, situation. So there, were, there is this Ministry of Local Government, there is this Ministry of Employment and Labor, Ministry of Food, Ministry of Social Welfare, Ministry of Housing, Ministry of Health and Anti-Corruption, and maybe many others. And I didn't find really any role of any of these departments which uh, could have ideally uh, supported her to, to allow her to live a basic minimum life that human being deserves. Now in Bangladesh, the public administration system suffer from a lot of uh, challenging issues and corruption is one of uh, them. And there is also this inefficiency in the system. Uh, there is huge uh, issue of nepotism and uh, politicization um, of everything. There is improper use of resources. And there is also this poor and un uninformed decision-making and planning. There is shortage of trained personnel. There is, um, there is this um, poor co coordination and transparency and accountability and also poor auditing system. And there is also this interministerial or interdepartmental uh, competition. Now, I would like to give only two examples of, of some of the issues that I've mentioned here as the problems of public administration system in Bangladesh. The first one, if you see in Bangladesh, we have 145 programs, um, which are social safety program or social protection programs. And these are operated by 23 ministries and divisions. And these, most of these programs are really targeting the extreme poor people in the, in, in the country in different manner. So there is a huge you know, fragmentation in, in, in the operation of the programs, which is really causing huge administrative cost. There is leakage, there is mistargeting, there is corruption, manipulation of program funds. There is also less accountability weak governance, and there is also this elite and political capture of, of the programs. The other example could be, if you see a few, day, a few I think a couple of years back, we have um, got this in the news, that uh, the cost of per kilometer highway road construction in Bangladesh is around 2.5 million to $11.9 million. So I don't know what is the cost in Sweden of per kilometer highway road construction, but it is far, far, far more than any other countries who are having similar kind of economic uh, and social status. For instance, uh, the cost for the same one kilometer road in India is around 36,000 to 45,000. In Nepal, it is 63,000. In Thailand, it is 59,000. In Brazil, it's 55,000. In Philippines, it's 60,000. In Nigeria, it's 73,000. And in, in Vietnam, it is 85,000. In compared to these countries, in Bangladesh, it is around um, 2.5 million to 12 million US dollar. So you can imagine how much, you know, uh, how much it is really corrupted, first of all, and how much inefficiently resources are really managed and uh, used for, for, for the development of the country. Now, first of all, we have, um, we have really already sensed a little bit about extreme poverty, maybe already. And then still, it is really very difficult to grasp the overall idea or the overall, uh, overall extent of extreme poverty because, you know, because of the complexity of poverty. And uh, the basic problem is not that, 
it, it, it's not only that it's it's difficult to difficult to understand it's also difficult to conceptualize even and no matter how much we really think about um, you know, poverty or no matter how much we investigate poverty there always remains something more to explain something more to explore and many analyses that really start that poverty is um, it start with the notion that poverty is about income but it, it's not really true poverty is much more about the economic aspect of it it's more about uh, maybe social relationship it's more about the economic causes so how can we really better define poverty and that is really one of the crucial fact here and how do even the poor define themselves as poor or extreme poor when they are really approached that is also very crucial uh, to understand uh, the complexity of the issue so das gupta here uh, attempted um, to, to to provide a hybrid definition of uh, poverty compiling definition from different scholarly sources for example from definitions provided by uh, the nobel uh, economist uh, economist um, Nobel laureate economist Avijit Banerjee Stadoflo. She he has also considered uh, definitions from United Nations Development Bank and institutions like World Bank. And what he is trying to say here um, in defining the ex uh, poverty or extreme poverty is uh, in the world of the poor, people do not really enjoy food security. They do not own any asset. They they are stunted. They are wasted. They do not live long. They cannot read or write, they do not have access to easy credit, they are unable to save much, they aren't empowered, they aren't employed, they cannot insure themselves when it is crop failure, or if there is household calamity or disaster, they do not have any control over their own lives, they do not trade with the rest of the world, they live in unhealthy surroundings, they suffer from incapabilities, and they are poorly governed. Now, if you look at the definition, I think no one in this world would ever doubt about its validity. But if you look even more carefully, you will find that it offers little guidance for action. So where you will really start to, to intervene about the problem. And it doesn't say what is the really cause and what is the effect. And it doesn't distinguish between the proximate and, 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 and the deep causes. Uh, of, of poverty. So with this complexity, if you see, there is also another false premise that, um, that we share. For example, the many of the social scientists begin from the false begin from this false premise that if you really understand better about poverty, it would offer more clearer and more direct answer about how to really respond to it. But is it really so? And Spiker here is saying that it, it's, it's not really likely the case because you know he has defined poverty like um, metaphorically, like poverty is a kind of chimera. I don't know whether you have really any idea about chimera, but it looks like um, the picture here I have shown. It's a kind of a mythical creature in according to Greek mythology. It's a fire breathing female monster with a lion's head, a goat's body and a serpent's tail. And, and it's, it's a kind of mythical animal informed uh, from different parts of different kinds of animals. So it is a kind of illusionary and, and a kind of impossible thing to really achieve. So it is uh, difficult to understand poverty and this difficulty and complex nature of, the, of poverty give it a characteristics um, being it a uh, wicked problem. Thus it is also uh, very difficult to formulate effective policy solutions also uh, uh, to, to reduce uh, or eradicate extreme poverty or poverty from the world. And we have also to remember that it is not only multidimensional and it has also different head. So it is multi-headed uh, at the same time. Some of the other, other, other features of extreme poverty is, uh, for instance, it, it's, it's not really kind of a fixed notions it is always a moving target and the problems are not really in the sense that the, the problem is not going to sit somewhere else and uh, waiting for someone to really solve them because it is it is very dynamic in nature and there is a constant kind of shifting and changing so new problems and issues are emerging all the time and that is really making it even you know more complex and complex 
every day. And there is this issue of predictive validity when we work on extreme poverty here, and uh, which assumes that uh, the same solution that work today will really work tomorrow. The same solution that work uh, uh, here will really work there in the same kind of context. But this is not the case. The problem is if you try the same thing twice, it doesn't really guarantee you that it will have the same effect for the second time, no matter even if you implement in the same place, in the, in the, in the, in the same manner, and, but maybe in a different time period. And Spiker here is raising an issue that uh, if we accept poverty as, as one of the wicked issue uh, and recognizing that it is a really very complex, multidimensional, and unclear and changeable, then it really makes it difficult to see what is really improvement and what is the improvement and what is not. And that's why you will see that there is always these debates in the development uh, studies or in the development area that some of the scholars or practitioners or organizations are proposing specific solutions to, to a particular context, to a particular problem, and they're very passionate about these kind of solutions. But at the same time, there are other groups who are really rejecting uh, such solutions. And both of these parties have really strong reasons and they know what they're really talking about. And each of them has um, still a strongly contrasting position. So how do you really decide with this kind of dilemma that how to move forward and how to intervene even uh, this problem. So what is Spiker is trying to argue that due to the complexity and wickedness of poverty and it is in its interconnectedness uh, with the social context, responding to poverty is not really a kind of matter of solving problems, rather it is about to trying to make things uh, better uh, than the before. Now, before we go to the rest of the discussion, I think I would like to remind you, maybe you have already had um, some ideas about it, uh, to, that uh, the first people who really um, coined the term was Rittel and Weber in 1973. And they have mentioned 10 different features of extreme poverty, which is really very important here to uh, reflect on. And the first one is uh, that extreme uh, wicked problems are difficult to define. There is no stopping rule. The solutions are not really true or false, rather they're good or bad. There is no immediate or ultimate test for solutions. And uh, attempted solutions have effects that may not be reversible or forgettable. There is no clear solutions. Every wicked problem is essentially unique. Every wicked problem may be a symptom of another problem. And the mul there are multiple explanations or definitions for the same problem. And the policymaker or the planners has no right to be wrong. And then, having said that, if we see here, there are important questions that we have to really raise here uh, to, to, to understand it better. And Katrian and others is raising this, these issues, um, which might be interesting even to brainstorm in our seminar on, on 7th. But this, this, this has to be uh, remembered that uh, what are the consequences of even defining a particular problem as wicked problem. And they're trying to say that uh, to raise the issue, like does the notion of wicked problems offer any kind of new insights on how to tackle wicked problems? Does it offer new governing ideas or solutions for tackling a specific type of problem? Does the concept of wicked problems help to deal with the complex challenges even or does it merely paralyze them? And what kind of actionable knowledge or governance arrangement can be used to navigate the challenges um, challenges of wicked problem? So we, we would definitely get back to, uh, to these discussions uh, and questions later. And we have also to remember here that how re you really define or level a particular problem as wicked problem uh, that is an important issue because, you know, first of all, to define a problem as wicked problem, you have to try some standard solution and you have to wait and see that these solutions are really failing. So it is a very time consuming process as well. So until you really try some standard solution to, to, to solve the issue and, 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 and wait and see that it is really failing, how can you even label 
something as widget. Now, there is also another issue. The, the issue is about framing issue. So if you, because you know, if you frame a particular problem as wicked, uh, no matter whether it is academically, politically, or publicly, in and itself, uh, it generates some kind of obstacle for addressing the wicked issue, because it, it, it discourages the practitioners and it demotivates and it it it, it makes paralyzed uh, paralyzed uh, all the efforts that we really can take to solve the issue, and uh, and and it even prevent the practitioners from even trying them because you know that it is it cannot be solved. It is really very complex. It is it is hard to even go close to the success of it. So if you create this kind of impression, you are really creating a kind of disabling environment uh, and discouraging environment. Uh, to even solve it, and there is also because there uh, because you are leveling this as kind of wicked problem, there is also this tendency of overestimate, and thus people also try to make effort like uh, rather than uh, solving the issue, they try to tame the wicked problem and solve a particular aspect of it. And the problem of this kind of approach is um, the and the overall broader context is is really lost there. And and um, and uh, Katrin and others they are trying to say that when you try to tame wicked problem, it gives a kind of sense of good feeling, but ultimately it deceives, or it is kind of cheating with the citizen of the of, of the particular country. So where do you really go from this kind of uh, challenges uh, uh, or, or notion around wicked problems? And they are suggesting three options here. The first option is is to reject the concept and rely on alternative uh, concept. For example, how, maybe instead of defining a particular problem as wicked problem, we can say it's a complex problem or something like that. So reducing the tone of it. And then the second option is to reconsider, de reconsider the defining criteria. As we have mentioned, the 10, ten criteria set by, uh, by the authors there. So maybe some of the defining criteria can be redefined or reconsidered. The third option is to develop and use the wicked problem concept in a more um, analytically, um, analytically uh, precise, analytically precise way. Now, when we work within a kind of institutional structure as a practitioner under under certain kind of public administration system, we have to remember that um, that although we have an extensive kind of um, understanding or evidences available on poverty, but public decision making is always uh, in practice reflects the interest of power elites or the political leaders. And this really makes the solution even harder to uh, implement. And in drawing attention to the interactable and contentious aspect of wicked problems, Rittel and Weber who first coined the uh, term of wicked problems argued that public policy response are often partial, and even there they can be counterproductive as well at the same time. And that's why they have suggested like there is a need of inclusive discussion involving a wide range of stakeholders, which is really very crucial because inclusive methods were seen as a kind of necessary to address highly contested uh, policy arenas and, and for planning. And, and here they, they are saying about the plurality uh, pluralistic aspect of you know to, to solve a particular as, a particular issue and ha they have mentioned one quote here uh, which says that every problem interacts with other problems and there is uh, and is therefore part of a system of interrelated problems a system of problems it's a mess the solution to a mess can seldom be obtained by independently solving each of the problems of which it is composed efforts to deal separately with such aspects seem to aggravate the total situation. So because of the enduring and the complex nature of wicked issues, the challenge for decision maker is to demonstrate uh, that the issues are really being well managed rather than fixed or solved. And it has, it has to be remembered that um, because um, the wickedness of uh, wicked poverty, so there are some politicians which are really trying, which, which um, and they really try to take a kind of rhetorical approach or rhetorical tactics to, to solve wicked issues. 
and which doesn't really work much, actually. For example, the claim by the politician that the, that the tough problems like illegal immigration can readily be solved by board actions, for instance, if you increase or enhance the broader border protection of the country. It's, these are the tactics like, which is defined here as rhetorical tactic, tactic, which doesn't really solve the actual problem, uh, but they, it really motivates them to go for this kind of solution to seek electoral support only. For instance, if you did not really solve the issue, uh, uh, what is going on in Syria and, and in other conflicting countries, I mean, the flow of illegal migration cannot be really easily, uh, easily solved. So you are like, you know, giving a partial solution and you are not really looking at the broader context of a, uh, of a problem here. So what, uh, what we can do here that uh, Head in his writing, he is saying that he's saying that for solving the issue, we have to draw on for, from, from more nuanced models of policy making and implementation uh, implementation. And that's why, first of all, the policy framing is really very crucial. So how you really frame a particular policy uh, problem, it gives you this, it, it gives you the sense how the solution uh, could be proposed. For example, if poverty is largely seen as um, generated by the deficit of the skills of, of people and, and their motivation, the solution that will be proposed would be really uh, towards encouraging individuals to develop their skills and work orientation. But in contrast, if poverty is framed as a, or seen as, uh, as an outcome of the social structure and, and features operated by the economic system and market forces, the solution that will be proposed uh, likely to be oriented to a social security system, employment programs, you know, strengthening markets and income and safety nets and others. So it is really very important how you really frame a particular uh, problem. And there is this other issue of policy design studies and assessing the capacity. So special care is really required while analyzing wicked problems. As such, problems are really often particularly uh, politically contentious. And in designing uh, the response to complex policy problems, there has uh, been a tendency by the government always to oversimplify uh, the particular problem or to fragment the issue into a more kind of manageable uh, elements of project or to have a kind of piecemeal approach of solving the problem. The danger of this problem, uh, of this kind of approach is that if you do so, the broader context of, uh, of the problem is really lost and it really offers limited kind of success and potentially cause more problems than the level of solution achieved. And at the same time, it is really very important to understand the difference uh, differences in the implementation context, depending on the complexity of issue, a mix of research knowledge, the practitioner's knowledge and citizen's experience. All those are together really required to understand the dynamics of client behavior and the program effects. And the important difference in the, in the dynamics and the configurations of the problems or issue and corresponding variabilities in, in, in the sets of actors, networks, capabilities and institutional context are really very important at the same time. And it is also mentioned that the managing the differences and the uncertainty is really very important because the wicked problems uh, perspective emphasize the role of stakeholders' perceptions, values, and interests in explaining how issues are really scoped, uh, prioritized, uh, priorities are set, and possible solutions are uh, considered. And for this one, uh, for the, and that is why for Rittel and Weber, they're, uh, they're saying that pluralism is really one of the inherent feature of our society to be really, uh, to succeed. So there is, uh, maybe you have already had the idea of um, the contrast between the monism and the pluralism. So Rittel and Weber is suggesting here the pluralistic uh, view in terms of having any solutions or taking any kind of decision. And there is also this aspect of collaborative governance. If you see that most of the, you know, uh, most of the time, the aspect of poverty or uh, extreme poverty is really kind, kind of interrelated with different kinds of other issues. And if you see at the sustainable development goals formulated by the um, United Nations, all these goals are really very interconnected. So if you do not have a kind of collaborative governance and governance approach, it's really very difficult uh, also to uh, solve them. 
Now we have almost uh, come to the end of the discussion here. So maybe uh, I do not know how you would like to level extreme poverty, whether you really would like to label even it as wicked, pro a wicked problem or, or complex problem, what, whatever it is. Um, we have to bear in mind that how it really implies or how it really uh, make the consequences or the outcomes difficult, it is really very important. So no matter how we define it, we have to remember that uh, extreme poverty is really a kind of complex uh, knot. And this extreme poverty is even composed of some other wicked problems at the same time. But we do not really, uh, if you consider wicked problems, and if you consider it is really very difficult to provide any solution for extreme poverty, we will be really uh, lagging behind in terms of our efforts to really solve the issues. So we cannot really allow millions of people in the world to live a life of indignity. And if you see in the sustainable development goals, we have this promise that no one to live behind. So at the end of the day, we want everyone in this world to live a life at least with a minimum decent dignity. And I trust from my experience of working with extreme poverty that extreme poverty is really manageable in the long run. So you have to always learn from trying and understanding the context and you have to keep yourself you know, engaged with the pace of change in the local circumstances there. And that is really very important. So it could be debatable, like uh, we could even further brainstorm in our uh, seminar on 7th uh, to discuss on how we can really start and address then as a practitioner and um, how we can really move forward. So let's uh, brainstorm this further in our uh, seminar. And I really thank you all for uh, watching this um, lecture. I hope you have um, at least learned even if uh, a little bit and it gives you a different perspective uh, from the Swedish context. Thank you.